Prime Minister has announced the most drastic limits to our lives. Stay at home and stay at least two metres away from people. The NHS will not be able to cope with lives. Social distancing has become the new norm. Cafes and shops are vacant. They've obviously shut down about half the US yeah. economy. Not only are stocks going down, Gold is going down, credit's going down. At this point, uh, it's clear that we're going to have a recession that's more severe than the global financial crisis. We are looking at other available options. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonite Season 3, live here from the Crypto Compare Digital Asset Summit 2020. And we have tons of mind-blowing and timeless interviews just for you, the awesome community. And today we're talking with Paolo Ardoino, CTO of Bitfinex, just because we had access to the story behind Tether. Tons of really interesting things we're going to debate. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment below if you hear anything interesting. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. But without further ado, Paolo, it's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you for having me here. I'm so, so happy to have you. And I have so many questions. But first and foremost, I was looking at your LinkedIn background. And I saw I'm a computer scientist and geek. Yeah. Can you tell me what geek means? In my days, you know, when I was in the, in the 80s, like the word nerd or geek was kind of like the guy who had pants up to here with the funny glasses and stuff like that. Is it a cool thing these days? Well, I mean, um, probably <laughs> I added to LinkedIn before it became cool. Uh, I think that I'm not updating my LinkedIn profile since quite some years. Uh, but, you know, I've been developing coding since I was eight. You know, I, was, I grew up in a really small town. Um, five, six hundred people. My, my dad bought me a computer with a uh, few of his salaries um, when I, yeah, when I was eight. And from there I started coding. Uh, my friends were all quite distant from my house. So the only thing that I could do in summer, winter was coding. So I feel like I'm, um, you know, uh, a geek and nerd. I mean, I, I spent, I'm, I'm only coding all, all, all my time. So that is a good definition for me. Uh, I, I don't have much, many hobbies or I don't have all these at all than just, just creating stuff. Yeah. So, um, but you know, today it seems like uh, cryptocurrencies made uh, the term uh, nerd and uh, geek more, more appealing and more, <laughs> more cool. So th that wasn't like that in, in back in the days. But uh, I'm glad that uh, that is, is, is getting there. <laughs> yeah, there are tons of really funny memes out there, you know, with kind of like the geek with a really cute girl and really funny stuff out there, which I'm sure everyone has seen. But uh, you mentioned something really interesting. You said you were taking computer science classes. And I remember a little bit earlier, you were saying like out of roughly 170 engineers, only between 10 to 15 were women. Was that the case when you were? Yeah, I mean, when I was at the university, um, the number of women in our course was was quite low. I'm, I'm, I think that is similar to that also today. Um, I think that we need more women. We need more, um, more women in uh, development, science, coding, project management. They are, I mean, the, sometimes they um, a team made only by guys is not as effective as uh, a mixed team or a team made by girls, but also a, probably a team made only by girls would not be as effective as well. So it's, it would be great to have a company that's made 50% by guys and 50% by girls. That would be more productive and uh, would grow faster in my opinion. That's a really good point. I mean, even I've seen in, in our team, so some women, women had great focus, like you were yes, mentioning earlier, yeah. and like you, you said, the attention to detail, which is critical, right? When it is, it's definitely, I mean, when you are on a trading platform, you won't, you, you don't have uh, space for errors. And uh, we, we um, often see women spotting things much faster than, than, than men. We are always trying to hire women um, um, uh, unfortunately, the number of CVs that we get is like 95, 98% guys, uh, 2 3% women. So why would these women or men want to join our space? Obviously, you as a computer scientist, you have many options, but you chose the cryptocurrency space. 
what were the motives that really got you interested in this space? Well, for me, it was um, thinking that eventually, looking back 10, 20 years, when the, the financial revolution would be completed or more established, I will be able to say I was there. Mm -hmm. I helped to make that happen. It's really rare um, that you have an opportunity as a person to, to be part of such a big revolution, right? And so for me, it's like, yeah, I, I, I was there. I was there, I did my part, uh, good or bad. Um, I tried my best to, to help this, this movement that I believe that is, is incredibly important to, to, um, to change the face of finance in, in, the, in the world because um, till today finance is, uh, is managed by the few. There are a lot of um, people unbanked. I believe that needs to be changed. Uh, Bitcoin is the right solution for that. And uh, that is why uh, engineers, coders, project managers, um, uh, marketing um, experts, and they are all trying to um, look into this, this new field uh, because it's exciting. It's like a territory, unexplored territory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have one opportunity in one hundred year like this. That is so lovely. I, I just love the way you put it because I, I felt exactly what you're feeling as I want to be a part of this financial revolution. You know, I'm approaching 40 this year and I want to do something that, you know, is meaningful in my life. And, you know, the day I, I leave this, this, this earth, you know, I want to really be uh, say that I'll be that I've done something to help this even a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, everyone needs to, to give it one hundred uh, one hundred percent. Then uh, I think that uh, is the first time that um, that a group of peers trying to create something that is that can be so revolutionary. Right? Is uh, this is peer to peer finance? We are creating a better system. I think that something that can is more resilient to problems in the future. Um, and and uh, I really love that. I mean, I'm all about peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, like peer-to-peer uh, um, -peer, uh, trading, peer-to-peer -peer, um, networks, peer-to-peer. My, my background is in uh, scalable networks and distributed computing. So uh, this is my dream job, dream life, dream future, you know. <laughs> oh, that's great. I can, f I can feel the passion. I can feel it. So in terms of uh, the actual cypherpunks, we were talking about them earlier. Were you inspired by the cypherpunks or were there particular people in this space that you look up to still as of today and you think, oh, this person is a great ambassador or this person motivated me? So there are many people in the space that uh, that uh, that motivated motivated me. I mean, well, I grew up, you know, looking at um, uh, films and uh, reading about uh, Kevin Mitnick, you know, and all the stories, uh, social engineering, Kubik. Uh, I was coding a lot, right? It was, you know, I, I really loved um, the cyberpunk aspect of our of our industry. I feel like with um, with time, um, while we go mainstream. Um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency will lose that aspect. Already, they are losing it a bit. Uh, but there are a few people. I believe that Adam Beck is one of the is the CEO of Blockstream. is a brilliant guy, uh, so work. knowledgeable, and he, I, I mean, is an inspiring figure. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, uh, I think that uh, I'm trying to do my best to keep uh, that aspect also in Bitfinex and Tether uh, because um, treating this as a playground to 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 create new th things, to break things as also. You know, the cyber, what I like about the cyberpunk um, culture is that things need to, to, to be super resilient, to resist even in the worst case scenario, e -e scenario even in the apocalyptic scenario, right? I like, I like that. I like to be, when I, when I create things, when, when, I see, when I talk to people that are like uh, Adam and, uh, and uh, other in, from other companies, uh, they, they they all think about how we can create something that would resist to any um, catastrophe and uh, you know um, uh, I, Blockstream launched the the satellite that is that is mind blowing is is so cool I mean you can you you can send transactions and and messages through their satellites I mean how what is more exciting than that so uh, yeah I, I want to be part of it.
it's incredible, like sending like peer to peer transactions through radio waves as yeah. well, even if the internet turns off. Now this cyberspace yeah. is definitely, these are very exciting topics for the future. And there's definitely one thing guys, if you have someone who really inspired you, don't forget to put them in the comments below. We just talked about Adam Back to massively contribute to this space. So don't forget to comment below. Uh, right now on stage, you gave a really nice presentation. Thank you so much for that. We'll put a link for everyone to be able to watch your presentation. And you were talking about the evolution of exchanges. Obviously, you have been here with one of the first gen, you know, Bitfinex, one of the biggest exchanges with fiat gateways. Can you tell us a little bit about this evolution? So let's say the past five to six years and a few minutes. Can you tell us how you saw the evolution of the exchange space? Yeah. So um, exchanges started as websites like, you know, <laughs> your um, oh, just small pages. Like written, shop, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like more e-commerces where yeah, but uh, custom made, uh, homemade yeah. uh, commerces. Well, the, of course, they, they were, but that is not necessarily a bad thing, right? They created, they were created by enthusiasts, mm -hmm. people that uh, were, they had this vision already. They understood the potential and they created these websites that then got more, more traction. So this in 2011, 12, 13, all there, there was a really huge uh, technology gap uh, in exchanges. Uh, the internet was already there and massive since 12, uh, uh, 12 years, right? And yet um, the exchanges were, we, what we call today exchanges were more really like uh, shops. shops yeah. Now um, in um, 2013, 14, that uh, the, there were um, more, let's say more engineers started to be hired by exchanges to trying to bring traditional finance knowledge into, into the, um, in, into the platforms, in these platforms. And, but the problem is that it takes maybe months to, to redesign a matching engine, and if not years, mm -hmm. and to find the right moment to do the integration, to swap from one or the other solution to the new ones, uh, to the new solution. And while you, you keep working on new things, on the new future matching engine, there is, uh, the time passes and you get uh, hundreds of new uh, traders per day mm -hmm. or per month anyway, and the current system is not able to cope. So you have customers that are pissed off and so on, right? Yeah. Because they cannot <laughs> use the platform well. Then that is part of my story. I joined, um, uh, I joined uh, Bitfinex in late 2014 because at that time um, the, um, their machine engine was uh, really slow. I mean, could like do 10, 15 transactions order per second. That, that is, is, was not enough. Uh, you have to remember that Bitfinex was the main um, trading platform offering uh, fiat on ramp mm -hmm. and margin trading. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of traction because we were offering margin trading. So you had the possibility of going long and short Bitcoin and Litecoin, right? And that brought a lot of people interested in that. But of course, if your matching engine is not fast enough, sometimes you, you have problems, you can have problems, you have lags. So you insert an order and maybe you wait a few seconds in order to get it executed. While people coming from traditional finance world are used to have microsecond or, or millisecond latency. So you, you don't even notice that. So the API traders that represent 95% of the, the, the volume made by exchanges are all about really high frequency trading. I want to place an order, I want to place 1000 orders in a second and I expect that they are all executed or they are, I get a knowledge, uh, a knowledgement for each of one in within one second, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but that was not the case in 2015. I believe that nowadays we are seeing more and more um, professional platforms. I believe that 2020, in 2020, we reached a really good point in terms of quality of the platforms in general. That's really interesting, but you're right. And many people miss kind of like this success secrets from the past, right? They'll build their online shop without looking what traditional finance does, uh, institutional great platforms, et cetera, and taking hints from the past. So that's a really, really interesting point. Was Mt. Gox the first real exchange and not shop? Or do you believe the first gen of, of crypto exchanges came with the, bit, with the Bitfinex era was that? Mt. Gox was, I believe, the first exchange, um, the first real exchange. Uh, it didn't end up well, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I believe that um, it was quite slow. They had that uh, matching engine called Midas that they were supposed to deliver at some point, but they, they, everything um, well fell before they could do that. Right, right, yeah. And that should have been a big improvement. So we 
we, we will never know how it was supposed to be before, um, let's say, crashing. Oh. But um, yeah, I, I recall seeing even Big Phoenix. I mean, it uh, was I mean it was really really ugly. <laughs> uh, when I when I joined, I mean the the book was refreshing every thirty seconds. I mean now the book uh, refresh every two milliseconds. Before it was thirty seconds. Before you see a new bid and offer into the uh, into the bid or ask side. I mean, crazy. <laughs> That's really interesting. In terms of like, this show is called Kryptonite. So the the Kryptonite of Superman. What do you believe is the kryptonite for exchanges as of today? And where should we go next year and the year after? What would you love to see in terms of development? So this is a great question. I believe that um, one of the missing pieces, you know, everyone talks about institutional money. It will come, it will come. But so far, it didn't really uh, come, right? What I believe that the game changer is um, uh, risk diversification. So it means that uh, hedge funds and people with uh, huge money are used to have one custodian, one trading venue, uh, one settlement platform. So um, you have three parties or maybe four parties or minimum two parties that so the, the trading venue is not also the venue that um, handles your money and your capital, right? So that is how it is supposed to be because, of course, if you trade on one uh, end, if you trade on the location and they have also full control of all of their funds, is one single point of failure. Mm. And we are building an entire ecosystem, an entire industry on uh, distributed, well, on resiliency, mm, right? Resiliency, so, yeah. and now, but we have centralized exchanges. I'm talking mm. as Bitfinex, I'm talking as the guy that runs uh, one of the biggest centralized exchanges. And first of all, we are working really hard to find an experiment with decentralization and with peer-to-peer -peer matching engine and things like that. Um, um, I spend a good time in coding uh, around this topic. Uh, but at the same time, it's important to start integrating other parties into the equation. And uh, like uh, this year, there is a big boom of crypto custody solutions. And as an exchange, we, we need to offer um, this type of diversification to, to um, hedge funds and institutions. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, they will not come. They will mm -hmm. not trust an exchange having both the money and being the trading venue. Because there is too much risk in a single location. So that still needs to come. Uh, the 99% of the assets are still sitting on exchanges. We probably will see some sort of shift. Maybe a 50-50% um, mm -hmm. in the next uh, two years. But it has to happen. Yeah, 50% for trading, 50% just for storing. Yeah. Exactly. That's really interesting. And you just mentioned centralized exchanges. You know, DeFi is a massive topic these days. I would love to hear your opinion on the DEX. You know, a lot of people say, well, but the DEX is a real libertarian, you know, type exchange. It has the philosophy of cryptocurrency because it's decentralized. Some people think that's not true. There are many debates back and forth. How do you feel about the DEX as of today compared to centralized? So I can, so we have um, uh, first-hand experience in that. So uh, with Bitfinex, we created the first uh, Adfinex that was, um, yeah, uh, that right. uh, at Hoffer, well, not non-custodial trading, yeah. and Usefinex, that is a fully on-chain uh, matching engine. Um, so we, when it comes, when it comes to technology, uh, we wear different hats. We try to, we try to play with, as said before, we are nerds. Yeah. So we like to play with things and break things. Now, we, we tried um, to build DEXs, my, and when there was not yet enough information about regulations. Mm. Now, I mean, all the DEXs, uh, it's clear that all the DEXs, if, if, if you are doing matching on chain, off chain, whatever, you are subject to the same regulation. So you, we, the problem is that you cannot hide behind your finger, you have to respect the regulation. So the only way to, uh, so the problem is that there is one single entity that will take the trading fees or there is a group of people that will get trading fees as much as you put a lipstick on that there is one single group one group of people that will get benefit from running that dax and that where the, the regulations will uh, are uh, will strike so the the only way to do that is to create a proper peer-to-peer -peer, um exchange where Everyone runs their own matching engine, and there so it's not one matching engine on on a, a blockchain, but is everyone runs their own liquidity pool, and they are all basically it's like Lightning Network nodes. Like network everyone nodes, is on yeah. their own 
then you can have market makers that can't get liquidity and they're trying to basically arbitrage between all these small nodes. But that's it. You can you have single entities, all hundreds, thousands of the single entities that run their own machine engine. They get their own benefit. So the system is fully resilient, right? Mm. You cannot have like one DEX that launched their token, that uh, the, their war token, that with the burning mechanism that benefit their community. That is a problem. That is at least what our compliance team has understood from the regulators. So I'm much more prefer to talk about and to consider an innovation, the non-custodial um, trading, right? So you keep funds that are that uh, on on a, on a smart contract. You use centralized liquidity. That is great. Is the uh, centralized exchanges has the most liquidity? Bitfinex is recognized to be the most liquid ex exchange across all um, the current big exchanges. And um, that's it. You use non-custodial training. DEX is not, I'm not a fan of them. That's, I love how you took the best of both worlds again, you know, thinking of how you can combine the, the two. And that's a really interesting point because, yeah, you're right. You know, people in terms of the DEXs, it all goes to one central point, right? Whether it's a middleman or a smart contract that gives you the fees, yeah. the money is still going to a central unit. Exactly. So... That's a really first time I heard that perspective. If you guys agree, disagree, have any thoughts on how decentralized DEXs really are, don't forget to drop them in the comments below. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, Tether, your presentation today, fascinating. Actually, as of today, Tether has higher trading volume than Bitcoin, obviously maybe for multiple reasons, which love to hear your thoughts. I believe it's $43 billion that are being traded on Tether as of today. Uh, first off, why Tether? So why did you guys create it? What problems were you trying to solve? And if you don't mind telling us, you know, why is the interest so high these days? That'd be great. So Tether was born to solve one simple problem is that Bitcoin space was uh, not really efficient. So there, we talk about the exchanges, right? There were um, uh, sometimes shops, sometimes were starting to look like real exchanges. It was 2014 and there were few um, exchanges like uh, Bitfinex, Bitstamp, OKX, um, Coinbase. So the problem is that um, when the, there were big price movements, the price was uh, changed, was, uh, there was a huge price discrepancy of even 20, 30 percent sometimes. And that is not the type of asset that cannot go mainstream. You, you, you cannot have funds that are stepping into a market that is so difficult to arbitrage. Because first of all, you have um, the friction. So the only way to do arbitrage between different venues is to send Bitcoin on one side and to send cash on the other side. But how you send cash is wires. Yeah. And wires take from one to five days. And what about the weekends? Mm. Um, that was not going to work. So uh, this, this group of guys are, uh, be, uh, behind Tether, these visionaries, the Tether team, really um, the, the base idea was how we can create a, a cryptocurrency that has the same value of the dollar, that, is, um, that has the same settlement speed that Bitcoin. So we send Bitcoin from, to one exchange, we send Tether on the other exchange, we, buy, we sell Bitcoin when that the exchange is higher and we buy back with the tether from the other exchange that is lower, right? Mm -hmm. Super simple idea. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's crazy simple, right? But no one thought about it. And this group of guys say, well, why we don't try to do it? And um, uh, that start, tether started like that. And um, um, the first two years was quite hard. It was quite hard to, to even talk to exchanges to explain the potential of tether. Everyone was kind of, uh, you know, uh, no, didn't really understand the potential. And then Polonix added it, was the first big exchange that added Tether and Tether pairs, and that created the first real arbitrage opportunity between um, Bitfinex and, uh, and Polonix. So you could start arbitraging Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin uh, pairs, uh, Tether pairs against Bitfinex that had uh, the peg between Tether and Fiat. So that was massive. That was the first time where, arbitra uh, where uh, spreads were really, really tight. Mm. 2017 was the real uh, year where Tether boomed because uh, Wobi, uh, OKX added uh, Tether pairs. Uh, Binance was born. Uh, the entire ICO world uh, and bo uh, boomed. And all these to new tokens were listed against Tether. Mm. All, everyone then had a Tether pair. So, the Tether demand grew from 20 million to 2 billion in one single year. It was crazy. I mean, it really was crazy. Yeah. It, it, it's, 
and um, Tether was, you know, started as a utility and become a huge business model. Uh, and and in a, so fast that we we couldn't couldn't believe it. It was was so crazy and and was so good to see. And then 2018, there was some sort of um, calm period. The price of Bitcoin started declining, and um, of course that also put a pause to the number of uh, tetras in circulation because the, we were going through a crypto winter that lasted till qu first quarter of 2019, and then after that. Um, 2019 uh, was uh, was the the second part of 2019 was characterized by nice volatility, the price of Bitcoin recovering. Um, we launched on many uh, blockchains, uh, so um, to to keep you know our our hedge, our first mover advantage. We understood that we Tether had to be this the common value across all the blockchains. Um, I don't understand when people. Uh, I mean, I'm a big Bitcoin fan, right? But uh, I try to not uh, to wear multiple hats and to not be involved in, in war religions, in religions wars, yeah. right? Because, I mean, I have to, I, I'm helping a company. I'm working for two really, all the biggest companies there. And I'm trying to be um, objective and trying to serve as many communities as possible because only with the, in that way, uh, we, will, we will keep our, uh, we will keep growing as Tether and we will continue to offer um, a better product. So, I mean, competition is still on one single blockchain, and for me it's crazy because it's the obvious thing is to, to be on multiple blockchains and serve as many communities as possible, right? The EOS has a big community, Ethereum has a big community, Tron has a big community, Liquid. So all these are um, communities that are worth serving and, and they will bring uh, additional value to, to your ecosystem. So why not? Exactly, yeah, exactly. So why, why hit on them when they're contributing to the space, right? It doesn't make any sense so, to have um, we, we felt that it was natural for us to be, become the liquidity center. Uh, and um, there are so many uh, new business um, opportunities around Tether that goes to a company that talk to us and say, well, we want to use Tether for remittances, for to pay salaries. Um, invoices. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, companies now that are paying uh, electricity bills in Tether. There are um, companies that are offering loans in Tether in exchange for Bitcoin collateral. I mean, so people, so businesses can grow uh, using a stable value without um, giving up their uh, commitment to long term to Bitcoin. So that is beautiful and that is adding an incredible value to Tether. And uh, DeFi is another space that we are tackling. Soon we are going to also launch, uh, announce a big uh, partnership with one of the biggest players in DeFi space. Um, Flash loans, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I believe that uh, we are seeing uh, DeFi, uh, that's a great movement. They are trying to, to build that open and fair uh, financial movement. We are seeing all the loaning um, industry booming around that. I talked about before the um, USDT loans. We will see uh, soon that we will see the um, the core um, few projects adding the possibility of borrowing USDT uh, with uh, BTC collateral directly through smart contracts through DeFi uh, projects and same or to basically uh, lend USDT to to others through these these smart contracts. This is, um, we got so many um, um, projects approaching us in the last two months, it's incredible. Flash loans are a really interesting um, use case, is, uh, well, was quite spoken in the last, uh, last weeks. Mm. Um, I believe that shows the, the type of innovation that this space is capable of, it is, is just mind blowing. That's fantastic. I want to ask you more about flash loans, but just one question based on what you're saying. So it kicked off Tether as kind of an ARB tool, arbitrage tool. Yet a lot of people use it as a hedge as well. Micro remittances, paying people, loans. So many utilities are getting built around Tether. Are there any reasons why people should use Tether and not US dollar, the actual fiat currency, when they're trading? Well, because um, fiat currency is slow. I mean, is uh, every time you move it, you have to pass through an outdated um, banking system. As much as you use um, Swift, uh, whatever you're using is still, I mean, is different than having a confirmation every 13 seconds that is Ethereum, for example, or one minute that is liquid, right? Is 
when you have your keys, the, I mean, think about the, the entire concept of having or holding your private keys. It's something you, you feel powerful. Yeah. You, you know that it doesn't matter how much money you have, but you know that that money is yours. No one will touch it. No one, as long as you keep your private keys safe, that is yours. And is, there is no better feeling than that. Like the entire idea of Bitcoin is not, not, your, not your keys, not your Bitcoin, right? Yeah. That, that is why cryptocurrencies are so important because it gives back the power to people. It's, you wake up in the morning, you have the good feeling that what you have is really yours. It's no better feeling than it's that. It's incredible, the ownership, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just having that. And you just raised a really good point. We had Rune Christensen, so the CEO of MakerDAO, on this show. And he was kind of saying that the future stable coins or decentralized coins or centralized coins will, will probably have a decentralized network with centralized coins laying on top of that decentralized network. Is that, do you agree with Rune and how he sees the future of stable coins moving forward? And how do you see this evolving eventually? I believe that we will see more projects like uh, MakerDAO. Uh, we are seeing already few of them, um, and many will grow. And centralized stable coins are, in my opinion, really important because cash reserves are a good um, mix in in um, in the bowl in the sense that if you have cash reserves, they they are stable by nature, right? You can have treasuries as well, but they are really really stable, right? So. Most of the DeFi projects that are offering stable coins um, have an hard time to reach really big sizes because of the um, huge dependency from cryptocurrency collateral, mm. right? So that is really, really volatile. So the risk of getting liquidated is really high and so on, right? So I would imagine that, let's say, an algorithmic uh, stable coin on a smart contract would like to have a good component of a centralized mm. uh, fiat yeah. and traditional instrument backed stablecoin in order to keep to de-risk it to keep the risk lower and i believe that so i i, I agree with with uh, with that idea yeah mm, was so nicely put thank you so much for uh, educating us on that now i have a question on you know how can we build trust for people to use tether imagine i'm a traditional guy i'm used to fiat currency this is a bit new to me and we're always afraid of new things like how do you build trust and how would you reassure people who are thinking of using tether rather than fiat currency directly i think that one of the major problems is the user experience so um, this is one of the real, pro well, one of the main problems in our industry in general. So there are not good wallets um, that are really easy to use for the average Joe. Um, I mean, I uh, with my parents, I mean, they even the Bitfinex application is really way too more uh, too complicated. It's too trading oriented. There are interesting projects. I be, I'm, I'm really in love with a few projects that uh, that are offering wallet around Lightning Network. They are super good. Uh, but there is still, I believe, a lot of work to do on user experience in general. And it's also important the speed of payment, right? Also when it comes to Tether. So Tether, the journey of Tether in experimenting um, is, is not completed yet. So because you said how we can have uh, people using more Tether, how can we can improve the adoption, right? And the way to do that is to ensure that when they go into the tube and they, they can they can pay with their phone like instantly with Tether. Yeah. So I believe that one way to do that is to create to and Tether is uh, is one of the promoters and, um, and is providing funding to a project called RGB Spectrum. That is a way to a protocol to to issue digital assets on top of Lightning Network. So Lightning Network, in my opinion, is the best um, uh, decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer micropayments protocol ever built and is how it should be built. So mm -hmm. I know that people have different opinions. Uh, we can, people like um, think that you can do all, everything on one single blockchain. You can have sharding. Fine. I, I disagree. My background is in peer-to-peer -peer networks and in distributed computing. That is how you, do, you build that. Mm -hmm. That's how you build a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, micropayment system. Now, the logic for uh, uh, following step is how we can bring Tether to, to, uh, to Lightning Network. So we are providing funding to this project and we are helping this project to grow and um, so then you can have a nice wallet where you can keep your Bitcoin, you can keep your assets that you build on top of Lightning Network and the settlement is instant, it's real it's time. Instant, yeah. so the payment will go through immediately without, without any, any problem 
and it will be easy to use for everyone. So we are really focusing on that side of, of the, of the to, to improve the Tether adoption in the future. For someone who works in connectivity and scaling solutions, you know, for financial engineering and stuff like that, I'm so happy to hear that Lightning Network is looking really good. Do you really believe this will solve the scalability issue with Bitcoin? Yes. You seem really enthusiastic about it. That is the right way. I mean, um, I like that Bitcoin didn't implement uh, smart contracts on the top of it. I believe that smart contracts should not be on the first layer. I mean, sh smart contracts should be built on the second layer um, or on, or on side chains, whatever. Um, I believe that Lightning Network is the right approach, is the only thing that can resist um, uh, really apocalyptic events uh, because is uh, there are small segregated networks that can be interconnected by bigger nodes. Is how it should be done. <laughs> so fascinating, Paolo. Thank you so much for all the knowledge you've shared today with regards to stable coins, with regards to DeFi, flash loans, cypherpunk, geeking off, being a nerd and all these cool things. Uh, if someone wants to follow you or get in touch with you, which uh, network do you use these days? I'm um, mostly on Twitter. Uh, that's my preferred social network. So uh, twitter.com slash Paolo Arduino, name, surname, all attached with no dots and, net, and uh, underscores that's or github that is really important and prdn awesome. so you can see i'm really active uh, a coder there so you can you can see the pro uh, the open source projects i'm contributing to um, so fantastic thank you so much for your contribution to this space and guys if you have any questions comments don't forget to drop them here below the more perspectives we have the more we debate, the better we become. We sharpen the saw together. So please do share your feelings and opinions. Don't forget to subscribe and we look forward to seeing you next week, eight o'clock GMT, premiering at a PC near you. Thank you so much, guys.